Beloved by God, church, let us begin our service before the Lord. Let us stand up and confirm the promise that belongs to the door of our hope. May the resurrection of Christ be enthroned within our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. And now allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted up to heights that are not reachable for us and destroy all burden and sin that binds us. May in the services previously all the works of devil be cursed, illnesses, poverty, untimely death, demonic possession, all matter of fear, destruction, depression, ignorance, and error, all of this may it depart from the tents of your holy people. And now stand, O Lord, upon the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed into your salvation and rejoice before your face. Give us more of your Spirit, saturate us with your Holy Spirit, allow us to find your great face. We thank you that the service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your godly hands, and we pray, continue to lead it with a mighty and powerful arm, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Book of Jeremiah 6, 16 Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. Returning to the old path of good. As a basis of our study of the old path of good, we turn to the words of Apostle Paul, who by the mercy and inspiration of the Holy Spirit was successfully able to, in short and exact definitions, explain the consistency of the order that exists within the teaching of Christ. Hebrews 6, 1-2 therefore sprinkling yourself with the elementary teaching of Christ and clothing yourself with the armor of light which consists in the rule of this teaching, we will then build ourselves into a house of God because it is not possible to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of the hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. It is not possible to lay again the foundation of repentance. We keep repeating and we keep looking at this truth. We do not lay again the foundation of repentance. We confirm our foundation that is in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> to lay again is that is when God has revealed his truth to a person. When he shows his grace in his spirit, And he, the Lord has revealed this to them, but they have rejected God's anointed ones, rejected his truth, and therefore God again does not lay this foundation of repentance. In a specific format as much as God has allowed and the measure of our faith, we already studied the doctrine of the baptisms, in three functions, baptism of water, Holy Spirit, and fire, the doctrine of laying on of the hands in its three functions, the covenant of blood, salt, and rest, and the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead in the functions of three births, birth from water, birth from the Spirit, and to the throne. Therefore, we will immediately turn to the study of the doctrine of the eternal judgment, which in Scripture is a triumphant accord in the elementary teaching of Jesus Christ, and contains three mutually linked levels of the will of God. Romans 12, 1, 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good <coughs> and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so good will, acceptable will, and perfect will. And you ask why specifically God's will in its form of being good, acceptable, and perfect 
and why is it a part of the eternal judgment? We need to understand that we need to understand the function that the will of God pursues. The function of the will of God combined these three wills are identified in scripture as a work of righteousness in the works of justice and a work of sanctification in the acts of holiness. The functions of the three forms of God's will combined are identified in scripture <clears throat> as a work of righteousness in the works of justice and a work of sanctification in the acts of holiness. Clothing a person into the armor of light. And when we're clothed into the armor of light, this light in us then is a demonstration of eternal judgment. As we can see, this final triumphant accord in the teaching of Christ, eternal judgment, it shows and accents the might of God's word. The will of God clothes us into God's judgment, into God's light. <clears throat> Revelations 22.11 he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. <clears throat> Here we see the two words. May he be and let him be. A person collaborates his faith with the faith of God. When the, About the unrighteous. It says, let the unrighteous, let, be, let him be unrighteous still. In their life, the word, let it be, does not exist. This only exists in the righteous and the holy one. The word, let it be, all of the promises that are in Jesus Christ are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. This means that the unrighteous and the one that defiles is one that cannot collaborate with the word, let it be, because all of these let it be and amen work for the glory of God through the apostles. And so we are blessed that we have <clears throat> the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Why? Because all of this glory of God is passed on to us from the person who is an apostle from God. In a specific format, we together in the doctrine of, of the eternal judgment, which contain, contains three levels of God's will already studied the first two levels, the power contained in the good will and the acceptable will, and we'll be studying the third level in the power of the perfect will, which is the omega crowning the elementary teaching of Jesus Christ. The wall of the heavenly Jerusalem consisting of the twelve precious foundations, the teaching of the eternal judgment demonstrated in the perfect will of God is made of the precious amethyst stone. Revelation 21, 14 through 20. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. 12th foundation, amethyst. Every precious stone making up the 12 foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem symbolizes a specific component identifying the character of a good heart. <clears throat> the Lord looks at our heart and He doesn't just see it as one precious stone, but it is made of the twelve precious stones. And every precious stone identifies a specific character of a good heart, a child of God from which we can conclude that when God will be building a relationship with man by the power contained in his perfect will, then he will be speaking to man by the voice coming from the sacred mystery of the unearthly amethyst stone. And I think that we've had the opportunity to look at these precious stones. They attract you as a magnet because they're so beautiful. It's hard to look at them for a short time because the more you move it around, the more <clears throat> you observe it, the more uh, lovely, the more beautiful it appears. And you begin to see other colors and tints and shades within these stones. It turns out that from all of these shades, uh, the blue and the and the red and the purple, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and all the colors are unique in their own way. It's not just a, a solid one color that you would get used to as in a paint, for example, but... Uh, it has so many var variations of color as well.
This is the good heart of a child of God, which in this 12th foundation represents the name written upon it, the name of the Apostle Judas Iscariot. Matthew 10, 2, 4. Now the names of the 12 Apostles are these, 12th Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And so the devil knew who to focus on. <clears throat> he wanted to focus upon the one that was the concluding accord. Judas, Simon, the goal was to kill Peter and to kill Judas. These are the two that need to be destroyed so that they betray Christ. Remember, to kill Peter and to kill Judas. And they both betrayed him. And the one God forgave, and the other he did not. Jesus said beforehand, I am the Alpha and Omega. If Peter loses his calling, then I as the Alpha, the beginning, the first, will take his place. If Judas, Simon Iscariot, loses his place, then I as the Omega will take his place, and I will find in the church then, uh, in the, within the saints or amongst the saints, someone who would be able to take that place. As we know, in the kingdom of heaven, everything is linked to a name, virtue, and place. And when a person loses his place, he loses his name. When he loses his name, he loses his virtue. But the place that has become free or vacant, <clears throat> it is still there. It's just waiting for its own precious stone a heart that has been built into a precious amethyst stone. And we say, Lord, we want that place that this betrayer has abandoned, and we today take this place. And all places we also occupy together with the apostles. <clears throat> and the twelfth we occupy with Jesus Christ. But the abilities, the, the, the qualities that uh, the apostle Judas had, they still remained there. At that time, he corresponded to <clears throat> to this uh, setting, golden setting, but he then lost his place, he lost his virtue. Peter also was ready to lose it, but he repented, and God received his repentance. <clears throat> We've noted that it is specifically the name of the Apostle written upon each of the twelve foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem that I, they identify the char- and they characterize this foundation. The name Judas means praising Yahweh. At the same time, the name Simon means to hear or to listen. Together or combine these two names upon the twelve foundation of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem mean given the legitimate ability to bring praise to God in the format of the perfect will of God which God will hear. God's praise in the form of the perfect will, which God will hear. 100% he will hear. You can be Hagar and be crying in the wilderness and God will hear. But there are, this one is at at 100%. And if you remember, in the case of King Saul, he asked for a witch, for someone to be able to speak to. And they said, turn to God, but he said, God is not hearing me. But to be able to speak with God and to guarantee God will hear you, our prayer needs to be done within the format of the perfect will, and it will then 100% be heard by God. And Jesus says, I know that you hear me because I do everything in the form of your perfect will. And because of this, and he said, he didn't say, I will feel that you hear me, but I know, (coughs) according to scripture, that you will hear me because my praise is being done within the perfect will, which you always hear. And my lips are your lips. In other words, speaking of praise, which God will hear, will become for God an opportunity for to fulfill his final verdict, one that is not subject to change or appeal as a just reward for the sown good 
and vengeance for sown evil. When a holy person of God speaks, Lord, may your holiness come down, and I call you in your anger. And he says, I will come. I may not know what he will be doing yet in his anger. We specify according to scripture, but there are some things when God does them, we still are surprised. Things we may not have even suspected or even greater than we could have imagined. And so to be proclaiming these things, this request needs to be within God's perfect will. Because when God will show his power in his holiness, in his judgments, the person then possibly who speaks these uh, things the first will be the first to uh, be judged. Let us look at specifically the components, the power contained in God's perfect will, or those places of scripture where that contain this perfect will. They're very important, these aspects for the people who search for the greater call in Jesus Christ. And so the word perfect is their word. It belongs to them. It doesn't scare them. It, as a magnet, draws them or attracts them first component of the power contained in the perfect will within the 12 foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is called to establish justice on earth by the means of a bruised reed and smoking flax. Establish justice on earth by the means of a bruised reed and smoking flax. This is God's perfection to establish justice with something that may be bruised and something that no longer is burning but just smoking and we'll see how this is happening happening Isaiah 42 1 through 3 <clears throat> behold my servant whom I uphold my elect one in whom my soul delights I have put my spirit upon him he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles he will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street a bruised reed he will not break and smoking flax he will not quench He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. This prophetic metaphor speaks of the fact that God will perform with the abilities of his perfect will which his servants will present whom God favors or whom God's soul delights. He is the one that is called to give God rest by establishing his justice on earth, or he will allow God's justice victory by collaborating with the bruised reed and smoking flax. And so the servant needs to establish justice and allow this justice to be victorious by collaborating with the bruised reed and smoking flax. God will need to find such a person or such a group of people whom he would be able to anoint and endow with power to establish his perfect and non-partial justice that would be able to give his spirit rest to allow his justice such victory that his coastlands would be able to trust upon. And all of this is possible by collaboration with the bruised reed and smoking flax. Now let's identify bruised. And pastor identifies this bruised reed and also the smoking flax by which we will be able to establish God's justice on the earth. Bruised. The reed is a symbol of our tongue and our mouth by the means of which we proclaim the faith of our heart. But this is not enough. It's not just a reed, my tongue, that speaks something. It needs to be bruised that can do something with God until this reed is not yet bruised it will break other people it will break and harm other people and so this tongue until it's in a bruised state we will try to fix others and unfortunately break them and so what is bruised Bruised is a demonstration of absolute reliance or trust upon God or absolute dedication to God and a refusal to trust upon any other power or authority. This demonstrates absolute insecurity, poverty, and deprivation, giving God the ability to trust man with the power of his justice or judgments 
God will not allow his power to mix with the power of human capabilities and abilities. The fact that he will not break this bruised reed speaks of him leaving this reed just as it is or in the state that it's in until by the means of this reed he achieves and establishes his justice. Very important state to be in. A bruised reed by which God will perform his judgments. And what is this bruised state? <clears throat> this is a demonstration of complete reliance, complete dedication upon God. I absolutely rely upon and dedicate myself to God. And so the bruised reed, it, it is bruised, but it can't be broken. And it's bruised, and so you cannot trust or rely upon it. And my goal, that it remain in this bruised state and it not be broken, to not be broken in faith. <clears throat> I demonstrate my absolute reliance, my absolute dedication to God. It's a very good position to be in because it allows God's power to be revealed. Not one that is, again, broken, but one that is bruised. As we know in the in this situation with Jacob, when he he was also bruised. And so this is the beloved uh, bride of the Lamb. She becomes this bruised reed, and it's because she relies upon God completely. Smoking flax. What is smoking flax? Smoking flax is a symbol of the faith of the heart, identifying the righteousness of faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Smoking flax is the faith of the heart, which identifies righteousness in the death and resurrection of Christ. The essence of the smoking flax is the state of a good heart, from which, by the means of the bruised reed, the good word flows. Therefore, we need to know that only having the virtues of the bruised reed and smoking flax are we able to fulfill the perfect will of God and simultaneously possess the guarantee that our names will not be blotted out of the book of life. And so the smoking flax, just as the bruised reed, is a very, a very important component. And this is the state of the heart that is founded upon the righteousness of Christ. It bases upon the righteousness of Christ. To be found in Christ, not with our own personal righteousness, that is from the law of Moses. And so the law says, don't do this, and I've never done it. And this it says not to do, I also haven't done this or this or this or this. Don't touch it, and I never do, did any of this. And so according to the letter of the law, you may appear righteous. And if you remember, Apostle Paul says, this is nothing to me. This is nothing, because the law may not condemn him, but he consid considered this as nothing, or as rubbish. And so this righteousness that is from the law, the law of works, which identifies the state of my heart, because of what I'm doing or not doing, I consider this as nothing, so I can find myself in Jesus Christ with His righteousness, righteousness by faith, and this righteousness by faith, we, we don't trust upon what we're doing or not doing, but righteousness looking at what God has done for me, so I may find myself in Him with His righteousness. And Jesus says this can only happen by faith. That means I need to now say that of all the sinners, I am the first. And so you, without sin, needs to need to say now that you are the first of the sinners so you could receive mercy from me. And when he said this, he became this, then, then the smoking flax. And when this uh, uh, smoke comes up and this fragrance come up, <clears throat> we consider all of our earnings as nothing and we look at only the earnings of Jesus Christ and we thank God for who he is and what he's done for us. When we state who he is and what he's done for us, this is the state of the smoking flax. And the bruised reed, we proclaim 
that, God, we trust only upon you and upon your mercy. We are then the servant that collaborates with these two. A very interesting principle and how beautifully our pastor has shown it to us. Second component of the power contained in the perfect will within the 12 foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is called to give us the opportunities to look into the perfect law of liberty. <clears throat> James 1.25 But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and, and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Let us remember that apart from the perfect law of liberty, the power of which is the grace of Christ, there is yet another law, the law of sin and death, the power of which is the law of Moses, and characteristically both of these laws live within the essence of man. The law of sin and death is present in the old man, and the perfect law of liberty is present in the new man. And both of these contrary to one another. <clears throat> these contrary to one another laws, with their own order and with their own values, live in one person. The field of battle upon which these two mutually exclusive laws play, they play out their drama for the right to possess this man, is the heart of the man. And the law that will ulti ultimately prevail in man will depend upon the choice that this person makes either to collaborate with the one or the other law. Therefore, so that man can receive the ability to look into the perfect law of liberty, it is necessary for him to first become free of the law of sin and death. And as much as we know, such freedom or liberation consists in the competencies and powers of the acceptable will. Specifically, in the acceptable will, we are free. <clears throat> we are free from the law of sin and death. And in the perfect will, we now look into the perfect law of liberty. This is because it is there that the old man is abolished, with whom we begin to have resistance or conflict. And only in the perfect will, the one that was previously abolished is now destroyed. In the <clears throat> in the acceptable will, he is removed from his power, and in the perfect will, he is destroyed. Like in the <clears throat> what, 1,000 years that Jesus will reign, uh, the devil will be bound and not be able to do anything. And after that 1,000 years, uh, he will be then destroyed. And the old man will be suffering the very same fate. The devil will soon be bound and put into a prison for a thousand years, and after a thousand years, he will be released, and he will be released, and he will think he could still resist God after that time. And he will want to gather everyone against God, and he will throw him into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet will be waiting for him and all of the wicked and lawless will also uh, join join them there as well <clears throat> and so we first uh, take power from him we abolish him of his power and then we will he eventually will be destroyed because right now his throne is upon our lips, but when he's removed from the, from the throne of our lips, he will then be waiting for the time when God with noise would thro will thrust him out and throw him into hell. Therefore, only in the perfect will and not earlier does a person obtain the ability to look into the perfect law of liberty, that is, when he is grown into a perfect man and is born to the throne. According to the given statement, the uh, the law in the form of which it was given by Moses was called to condemn a person to death at the same time the law of grace representing Christ and not Moses was called to condemn death itself and return the person into the bosom of eternal life again 
the law in the form in which it was given by Moses was called to condemn a person who sins to death. The law of grace representing Christ was called to condemn death itself, condemn sin, and return the person into the bosom of eternal life. The law of Moses is spiritual, and the law of grace is also spiritual, and the law of grace is not liberal in its form. It is different in that it specifies who needs to be condemned to death. The law of Moses is broad and it does it, it decides I need to kill sin in the sinner and so sin with the sinner as they wanted to stone the the woman if you remember when they gathered the woman because she was committing adultery they wanted to stone her to death And so what he said is, if you remember, the one that is without sin, may he cast the first stone. And what did he do? That he did do. Jesus stoned him, or them, with, his, with he stoned them because of their sins. At that moment when he said these words, he stoned them. Their conscience began to burn, uh, and and condemn them, and they left. And so then he asked this woman. She was left alone with Christ, and he asked her. Is there no one here to condemn you? And she said, no one. And so the spiritual law that was given through Moses, it was given to condemn the sinner. Grace condemns uh, not us now, but this, the old man who, who is the producer of these sins. And so our soul needs to uh, separate from the old man because right now uh, because of the old man you are technically will be punished in the same manner or you will be condemned together with the old, with the old man of law of sin and death but you need to die for your nation the house of your father and your corrupt desires and God will then el- eradicate him or help you eradicate him from your system <clears throat> from your body According to scripture, the perfect law of liberty in Christ Jesus called to give life, built new relationships between the perfect and righteous God and a perfect and righteous man. Therefore, when Apostle James wrote, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The phrase, this one will be blessed in what he does, means that only the one that looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is the one that will be saved in Christ, will be delivered and will be brought out from under the hit of the just vengeance of God. This means that in order for a person to be blessed, he needs to look into the essence of the perfect law. Therefore, the verb looks or looking into the perfect law of liberty means <clears throat> we'll look inside the law of liberty, we'll look closely at the law of liberty, we'll focus upon the law of liberty, we'll peer into the law of liberty will dive into the law of liberty and place yourself into it. You will make the perfect law of liberty a continual place of dwelling. You will thank God for being able to abide in the law of liberty and will proclaim the interests of the law of liberty. Third component of the power contained in the perfect will within the twelve foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is called to give us the power to discipline our mouth in accordance with the demands of grace. James 3, 2. All of the places that our pastor brings forth, they always have the word perfect or perfection in some way. We're talking about the perfect will of God and the eternal judgment. James 3, 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle the whole body. To discipline your mouth in accordance with the demands of grace means to speak what makes for peace and mutual edification. We're going to look at how we need to discipline ourselves because a perfect man is one who is able to discipline his old body. That means not to sin in word. You need to discipline your mouth. 
put a bridle upon the mouth of a horse uh, so he can control his whole body. If we don't have this bridle upon our mouth, we don't have this gentleness of Christ, then we absolutely are not able to control our emotions or our body. <clears throat> and we can then easily harm others and offend those who offend us. We need to begin disciplining our mouths, put a bridle upon our mouth. To discipline your mouth is, in accordance with the demands of grace means to speak what makes for peace and mutual edification. We will see how we need to put this bridle upon the mouth. Romans 4, Romans 14, 17 through 19. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approached by men, and approved by men. Therefore it is us who pursue the things which make for peace, and the things which one may edify another. And so this is a winning variation. And so sometimes when we communicate with someone, there may be a conflict to avoid these conflicts. If we speak for edification purposes, by speaking of what God has done with me, how I see the word, have understood the word with our pastor, <clears throat> being able to learn it, how I was able to learn it. But when we are doing other things, not re- disciplining our tongue, then we obviously can end up in certain problems. To dis- discipline your tongue so you can be a perfect man. A perfect man is one able to discipline his tongue. To discipline your tongue in accordance with the demands of grace means when interpreting the word of God, only speak what is the revelation of the heart and not the fruits of your personal intellect. Songs of Solomon 4.11 Your lips, O my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. And so a disciplined mouth (coughs) is one that has honey and milk under her tongue. I can receive revelation, I can receive honey, but it needs to be accompanied by milk. This is the pure milk of the word. I accept the person who is a father over me. I receive these revelations and I expand and I and I dig into the principles that pastor gives us. Right now we read the works of uh, Apostle Arkady. We demonstrate what <clears throat> honey and milk is under the tongue of the beloved. To discipline your tongue in accordance with the demands of grace means to speak truth in your heart, not backbite with your tongue, or take up reproach against your friend. Psalm 15, 2 through 4. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart, he who does not backbite with his tongue, does not do evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a, a reproach against his friend, he who does these things will shall, shall never be moved. And so this is for us, Psalm 15, 2 through 4. If in our church... Uh, We are told not to spread rumors or to accept them. If a person speaks uh, speaks rumors against his neighbor, and so one who does not do these things, he does not he does not do these things. He shall never be moved. To discipline your mouth in accordance with the demands of grace means. Do not say that the former days were better than these days are. Ecclesiastes 7.10 Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. The Lord says, today needs to be better than yesterday because the salvation of God grows. It is expanding. And so if it is better today than yesterday, and if it's not better, that means that our salvation is diminishing and not expanding. Your salvation is increasing, expanding. I was in church, I heard something new, and this will change me, I will become better in some way. I've learned more. I can confess better things before your face, Lord. It's not possible that it's today's worse than it was yesterday. Although in dead religions, they they talk about how in these years or other, in certain years that they God did miracles and signs, and they they felt the work of God uh, more than they do today. (laughs) 
To discipline your tongue in accordance with the demands of grace means when you are tempted, not say that it is God who is tempting you. James 1, 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. James 1, 13 through 15. The devil, he tempts and tries to draw people into sin. And so this is, the Lord uh, tests people. He, he tests people, examines people, but he does not tempt people. To discipline your tongue in accordance with the demands of grace means to avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Second Timothy 2, 23 through 26. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in op- opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. In other words, never ever prove the truth to someone. I remember this forever. Pastor taught me, even from a younger age, never ever try to prove the truth. Even if you put a person in a situation where you can prove it, afterwards you will feel like you were defeated. Truth is not proven. Truth is shown with your life. And one that is drawn to the light, he will ask questions. He will ask you of what needs to be done. And that's when you can explain it. Show it as an example, but do not prove it to people. To discipline your tongue in accordance with the demands of grace means speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Titus 2, 1 through 8. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. And so, a sound doctrine is that the the people of the household, the people that are elder, that they be in love, that they be not be drawn to to alcohol, be sober minded, that they love children, that they be incorruptible, they be in reverence, they have integrity, they have sound speech, and not be condemned. And he says. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Titus 2, 1 through 8. And so this is how uh, it is, What is, this is what it means to have sound doctrine. Where it says the elders may be sober, sober and reverent and temperate. And so these words that Titus gives, we need to have purity in our uh, in our doctrine, one that is sober, that is sober, for the sober-minded, and it explains in detail everything that needs to uh, be seen within these words or how these words need to be stated. Unfortunately, there are churches where they present uh, a damaged form of truth and it has no life in it. It needs to be sober, it needs to have life in it. To discipline your tongue in accordance with the demands of grace means to be silent when God arises from his holy habitation. To be silent is also a way of disciplining your tongue when the Lord speaks. Zechariah 2.13 Be silent all flesh before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. And how do I determine that the Lord is aroused or where he is? It's very simple. Right now the Lord has been aroused from his holy habitation. We are silent and listening to the word of God. When Apostle Arkady speaks or his helpers uh, speak in the same spirit, we are silent because the Lord is aroused from his holy habitation. Ecclesiastes 5.1 Walk prudently when you go into the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, but they do not know that they do evil. They come to the church and begin to do something, 
they began doing something, began to uh, some sort of activity all the time. Allow the Lord to arise, and that means we need to be silent and listening to the word of God from his person, from his messenger. And when we have allowed him to arise, then we begin to offer and sacrifice to the Lord. And when he rises, uh, then we will be able to do this. In the beginning, we note that pastor always, in the beginning of the service, pastor uh, starts with the word. He doesn't he doesn't ever begin uh, with let us just start singing he starts with the words of faith and amen he does this according to scripture in our service the Lord needs to rise from his holy habitation and when we have called him now we can uh, sing psalms to him if a person disciplines his mouth in accordance with the demands of the law of grace and the above listed components, then this indicates the fact that this person is, is collaborating his faith with the perfect will of God or abides in the perfect will of God. Fourth component of the power contained in the perfect will within the twelve foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is called to prepare us for every good work. Second Timothy 3, 16, 17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, so that a person of God can become perfect and in this way would be prepared for every good work, that first he needs to perceive all of Scripture as God-inspired, and second, have the character of a student, where your heart can be prepared by the given Scriptures and be for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. And so I perceive all of the word of God as God inspired and I prepare my heart as a student so that the Lord may correct me, would instruct me. And profit me. And so a person had come up to me and said have you spoken these words that you spoke from the stage about this other brother and I told him, this person let this other brother let this other brother come to me and ask himself if he feels this way and so I will tell this person uh, personally if somebody thinks that it was something about them but a person obviously saw himself in the words that were being spoken and uh, considered it that it be about him and so if it is something that applies to us we need to receive it as a form of correction and so we need to ask the question what is a good work and in what way can we differentiate every good work from dead works what are good works the scriptures say The scriptures say that we need to be ready for every good work, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.17 First, according to the given place of scripture, every good work is identified as performing righteousness in conjunction with or together with sanctification. When a person, by the means of learning, will be instructed by all scripture, how to abide in righteousness, only then will he be prepared for every good work. Revelation 22, 11, 12. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give everyone according to his work. Therefore, every good work is seen as every righteous judgment coupled with every sanctification. And so, in sanctification, we perform God's righteousness. Second, every good work in the form of all of the judgments of God, a perfect person is ready for every good work. And so, what is this good work in the format of all of the judgments of God? This is the work of God where the righteous 
establish God's justice. Deuteronomy 1, 16, 17. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Here are the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment's judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will hear it. Deuteronomy 1, 16, 17. And so not looking at the face, whether it be my relative or my my son. And so, of course, I then will can discipline my own child in certain cases. Uh where sometimes you will ask someone if they your child if they did something and they say well yeah I did this but they don't fully acknowledge and so you need to sometimes question them further and to ask who started the fight who 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 responded uh, and how they may have responded either physically or in other ways and so for in the case that maybe somebody for example if someone hit your son and your son returned it and hit them back uh, you may they may have not started the fight but they did respond to it uh, in, in this way and it is also wrong or wrongdoing and so again if, if a person spoke back or hit back uh, in response to something it is still uh, this child is still guilty in this, because of the way that they responded. We're talking about perfection or perfect people. Third, every good work in the form of all of the judgments of God is the work of God written upon the tablets of our heart. Exodus 32, 15, 16. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain and that two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and the other. They were written... Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And so our heart is presented in these two tablets, as written upon on both sides. These two tablets are the word of God, Holy Spirit. They are the word that we receive, the preached word we receive that God's messengers give us. When we receive the word, uh, it goes into my intellect. I just try to memorize it. And, and when it accesses my intellect, when you just read the Bible and it, and it is it, it is only going into my intellect and I try to speak these uh, uh, places of scripture, I, I recite them before God. Uh, but, but when we abide in this word, this uh, offered word by his messengers, it goes into my spirit. And to be able to read this, I need to die for my nation, the house of my father and my corrupt desires receive a person that is sent by God and collaborate my heart within the words of the person whom God has placed. And this is a process. And this means this word has now fallen into my spirit and from the position of my heart, I renew my mind and then confess the word of God. These are God's tablets, God's work. Fourth, every good work on the form of all of the judgments of God is the law of sowing and reaping that is initiated by our personal tongue. Matthew 12, 37, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. A holy person, he just uh, justifies himself according to the word and is condemned according to the word. Fifth, every good work in the format of all of the judgments of God is to believe or to obey the one whom God has sent and placed. John 6, 27 through 35, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has sent his seal on him, has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may do the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in whom he has sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. 
for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us the bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And so Jesus says, I am this bread of life. And so we need to understand what, uh, who, who is the one whom God has sent. When a person comes and says, the Holy Spirit has sent me, we uh, open the place, this place of Scripture and says, we need to believe in the one whom God has sent. And, you, and a person makes a decision and accepts this person. But no, you first need to uh, check, examine whether this person is truly sent by God. 1 John 4, 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come on in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you you is greater than the one who is in the world they are of the world therefore they speak as of the world and the world hears them we are of god he who knows god hears us he is he who is not of god does not hear us by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error and so every spirit that does not confess that jesus christ has come in the flesh Every person, again, who does not confess that that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And so often, some of these churches uh, and so when people title things uh, in other churches saying that what God has not been able to do that God has not been able to do in the body of Christ within the span of your life, we will be able to achieve within three days of an, an encounter. And people start coming to this place thinking that there will be some changes. And after three days, they, uh, they're they done. Uh, they begin to become many antichrists. Uh, the, the Pentecostal churches began to divide. Baptist churches began to divide. Uh, there was so much division going on in the churches. The encounters, their main purpose of encounters is to do for you what God can't do for you in the church. And they were saying that God can't do anything in the church because they say, look, nothing's happening. And so they offer to do it out of the church. And so every spirit that uh, does not confess in the church of Christ is, is a true antichrist. And those who have visited these uh, encounters, they went went back to their churches, but these uh, people be- became these antichrists in the churches and became pro- uh, very problematic. And so we need to know that God works only through His Word and His Holy Spirit in His church. Sixth, every good work in the format of all of the judgments of God is the price of fragrance called to prepare the Son of God for burial. Matthew 6, 26, 6 through 13. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. You, you have the poor with you always, but, but me you do not always have. For in pouring the fragrance of oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Matthew 26, 6 through 13. If you remember, they came to the grave, and the grave was open. His tomb was open, uh, and nobody was there. If they they went to visit, and and the angel 
uh, angels asked the people that came to his his tomb, uh, why are you searching for the living among the dead? And so for this, his body needed to be anointed. On Sunday, he was to resurrect early in the morning. And this woman beforehand in Bethany already put this fragrance, poured this fragrance upon Christ, this fragrant oil. She prepared him. She already did what Mary and Mary of Magna wanted to do uh, after his death, but uh, it was no longer necessary because this woman in Bethany did this work. Uh, that's how the Lord did the the Lord's work was done here this woman in Bethany she prepared him she she applied it upon his body and uh, so therefore he was ready beforehand for this sixth every good work in the format of all the judgments of God is to reject all unrighteousness that infringes that infringes upon the elementary teaching of Jesus Christ 2 Timothy 2.16-21 But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and, and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the Master, prepared for every good work. And so to be this vessel that is good for every good work, means to keep yourself from all profane and idle babblings in this case. And idle babblings is the first thing that infringes upon the word of of, of, uh, of God, the elementary teaching of Christ when people gather together and begin to speak anecdotes and other uh, useless things. We need to understand that maybe we're laughing but uh, in God's presence, uh, uh, it is this is not something that needs to be taking place. To infringe upon the teaching doesn't mean I don't accept the teaching that your apostle teach. I don't accept the teaching that your apostle uh, pre- gives us. But this idle uh, sayings and babblings will God will remove that from the church. Seventh, every good work in the format of all the judgments of God be subject to and obedient to all authority on earth within the boundaries implemented in scripture Titus 3 1 2 remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey to be ready for every good work to speak evil of no one to be peaceable gentle showing all humility to all men very interesting fourth component fifth component of the power contained in the perfect will within the twelve foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is called to clothe us into perfection that is like the perfection of our heavenly father Matthew 5 45 48 that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust therefore you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect the given command about the level and virtue of perfection comparable to the perfection of the Heavenly Father, although beyond the limitation of the reasonable abilities of man, is for every saved person, it is the perfect will of God. We can't, with our regular intellect, understand the perfection of how we can become perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, but according to Scripture, we begin to uh, learn how to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, which is why the level of greatness and essence of the virtue of such perfection is not addressed to the perishing world and not to those called to salvation, but the chosen from the multitude, multitude of the called, who by the measure of their relationship with God possess the virtue of students of the Lord, to whom it is given to know and apprehend the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. 
who can be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, is a person who is chosen from the multitude of the called. What does it mean to be chosen? It has a lot of uh, definitions. Chosen is separated for God, holy, redeemed by God, consecrated by God, taken by God into His lot, acknowledged as God's belonging, or known by God before the creation of the world, predestined to be the to be in the likeness of the Son of God, destined by God to fulfill His works, called to fellowship with the Son of God, sealed or mar- or marked by God, justified by God, dedicated to God, given the power of the Son of God, and praised by God. The virtue and verification of such choosing is identified in man by him producing the fruits of the Spirit and not by him practicing spiritual gifts. The status of a student testifying of, of God choosing him is the inner state of active humility in knowing and fulfilling the perfect will of God. The measure of a student as well as the measure of his humility can vary depending upon the measure of his knowledge of God that is knowledge of God that and so the the measure of of your knowledge of God or, or you being a student will deter, depend upon hu- your humility or how humble you are and so depending on how, how humble you are is how you will be able to learn or know about God and then and so the measure of your humility and dedication to God And so your humility depends upon the measure of your knowledge and that in turn depends upon the measure of the dedication you have to God or the measure of the price you pay for learning. Due to which the virtue and status of a student in the infrastructure of the kingdom of heaven is considered the greatest ranked comparable to the virtue of a servant of the Lord. Having this combination of the three virtues, a son, a student, and a servant serving as a confirmation of one another is how the Son of God builds his relationship with his heavenly Father. These three virtues, uh, they confirm the truthfulness of one the other. And so you could say, I am a student, am I a son also, am I a servant? These are three three virtues. Uh, so, so if I'm a student, I should be a servant as well. If I'm a servant, I should be a son as well. All of these three these three ingredients, we could say, are in one, and that is Jesus Christ. Isaiah 54, 5. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Isaiah 54, 5. Considering that God is the true light of life, enlightening every person that comes to the world, the command of the Son of God given to his disciples that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, aims for his students being able to be clothed into the power of his light and his clouds, so that he can present the perfection of his heavenly Father, calling them from darkness into his marvelous light, both the righteous and the unrighteous. Job 37, 11 through 14. Although with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for his mercy. Listen to this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. I will allow myself to remind us that the scriptures split our enemies up into seven distinct categories, four of which we need to love and bless, just as God loves and blesses them, and the three others to fulfill the will of God, We need to condemn to judgment since they reject the light and do not come to the light. Firstly, who are we called to love? We are called to love fleshly Christians, those of our household, followers of the law of Moses, and people of the world. But we are called to hate and avoid any conversation, fellowship, and any contact with the following enemies, fallen angels, our carnal man, the old man, and the wicked. And furthermore, we are not to bless them, but hate them just as God hates them. And so we need to understand that 
amongst our enemies, we may also have people of our house or just fleshly Christians in the church, people of the world. There are enemies that we need to hate, and there are, and you can determine whether a person is uh, of the flesh or of the spirit. A spiritual person is determined by having enemies whom he loves and blesses and there are three others that he does not love or bless or the four others that he does not love or bless and the three or the three he does he does not bless and the four that he does bless and love and so again the ones that we are to hate fallen angels our carnal man the wicked and the ones we are to love and pray for the four fleshy Christians those of our household followers of the law of Moses and people of this world But if so, if you hear that someone will say we need to love all of all the all of these people, then this is a person that is obviously a carnal person. And furthermore, uh, the component of the power. This is the sixth component of the power contained in the perfect will within the twelve foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is called to give us rights to receive from God every good and every perfect gift. James 1, 17 through 20. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. So then, by my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of the man does not produce the righteousness of God. This place of Scripture speaks of the character of leniency of the perfect gift and the possible reaction to receiving this gift because the leniency of the perfect gift in our time will not correspond uh, to our waiting and cannot prompt and can uh, prompt anger within us. If you remember in the illustration of Naaman uh, when he wanted to be healed by the prophet and the prophet told him go and dip yourself sometimes in the river and you will be healed. But you could say, I'm sorry, I came from a far city as from Syria, uh, and all you tell me is go and bathe in the river, and the waters we have there are much cleaner than the river, the, the water that's in this river. I He imagined that this prophet would probably put his hands upon the wound or put his hand upon him and pray for him. And his servant even told him, if there was something that... Uh, you're asked to do just go and do it and he and he said if you can you he he convinced him to do it his servant convinced him to do it and he did go do it and he dipped himself seven times and his skin became as a little child of course it's hard to imagine a man with such uh young young skin or the skin that looks like a, a, a baby skin And so the Lord sometimes does these things that are amazing. And so you see that sometimes a person has uh, his own opinions, like for example, that you may not want the baby skin or youthful, uh, skin that is like a baby, but rather uh, a more uh, masculine look. But in this case, God wanted to show, show this amazing example. Seventh component of the power contained in the perfect will within the twelve foundations of the wall of the heavenly Jerusalem is the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3, 18, 8 through 15. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended 
But one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have the mind. And if anything you, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Philippians 3, 8 through 15. We are going to pray right now, and I call everyone out here who have perfection in Jesus Christ. And we have this perfection not because we have done some kind of good work. We have this perfection because we were born from the holy and perfect God, and we are His children. And if we sin, this does not mean that we no longer are righteous. We, in Uh, sometimes people are in infancy where you cannot perform God's righteousness. But the time will come when we can perform righteousness, and we will. Uh, the time will come when we will not suffer from our feelings. We will be able to rule over our feelings, control them, and for this we need to eliminate, abolish uh, the old man from in ourselves. And the time will come when he will bl- he'll thrust him out from within our body. Right now we will come out here. We will repent confess our sins before him this is that moment when we will put him in prison our old man who has forced us to sin we wait for you here at the altar let us pray I'm going to pray our prayer. I ask you to deeply believe that God is on your side. He's not against you. He has loved us with an eternal love. He has given us the work of His redemption. He has stood between us and our enemies to protect us and to lift us up to His level. Close your eyes. This is your secret room. Lift your hands to God. This is a sign that your hands are without wrath or doubt. Pray together with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you and upon this holy place in the church of your holy nation, I open up my heart so that you may see my pain, my sufferings, my wounds that are inflicted by sin and lust, which I hate and that I reject. I come to you with my dependence, with sin that I'm bound with, with a pampered dignity and dishonor, I ask you, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, heal my wounds, restore me, protect me. And right now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim 
that in accordance to your word, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May He look upon you with His great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they will not touch you. May the blessings of the ancient mountains and everlasting hills be on you. May with noise the old man, the stronghold of death, be thrusted out from your body, and in its place may the stronghold of life be erected. May all this be upon you and upon your children, and the nation shall say, Amen. And as you're finding your places, I want to call out David Berezovsky and Alexander Popkov. So they've been waiting now three years. Three years they've been waiting for this moment. The scriptures say love is long-suffering, and so they love each other. We ask you to welcome this. They have been instructed. They have spoken to Pastor Arkady. He is aware. And so the wedding will be uh, in two weeks on a Saturday, very, very soon here. And it will be here in, in the service in the church. And so may the Lord bless you. You may take your seats. And now let us finish with our manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.